Hello, Cinefans. I'm Kendall Kruver, and this is Watching Classic Movies. Toshiro Mufune was one of the first classic film stars I loved, and yet I didn't know much about him personally. I decided to remedy that by talking to writer and Cine Journey's co-founder, Jill Blake. Jill has researched and written about Mufune and has a lot to share about his life, career, and remarkable partnership with filmmaker Akira Kurosawa. Welcome, Jill. I have wanted to have you on the podcast for so long. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Kendall. It's awesome to see you, even though it's uh, virtually. Yes. Uh, it's, yes. Been a, it's been a minute. Right. It has. I know you love Toshiro Mufune. Mm-hmm, and, I do. And, you know, we've talked about this. How absurd that this man, who's just one of the most magical actors ever, one of the most beloved, he wanted to start his career as a photographer behind a camera. I mean, that right. is really amazing. Yeah, it's completely absurd because, first of all, the man was gorgeous, right? Yeah. And he had this magnetism and Kurosawa had described him as kind of having this animalistic quality. He it was like a wildness. He started working in because his father was a photographer. So he was working in his father's shop. And so he learned that trade. And so he kind of wanted to continue on that path because that's what he was he grew up around. And his parents were actually Methodist missionaries, which I think is also very interesting for many, many reasons. He was born in China as well, because they were there as missionaries. So, and they were, I think they were, it was like under military control, um, Japanese military control. He always had that kind of artist streak, creative streak. And then he had to go serve in the military. And he had never stepped foot on Japanese soil. The ultimate Japanese actor. Yeah, you know, so he's, you know, he's Japanese by his parents but he's born in china he gets drafted into the imperial air force and he's like i you know i don't even know these people (laughs) you know like i don't you know i have nothing you know no real identity to this and here i'm having to do this he hated it he absolutely hated it just the entire experience he called it the senseless slaughter Mm. so imagine getting i mean and the same would go for you know, men here in the United States that were drafted and didn't want to go. And the stuff that, you know, you're talking about average people who were, you know, bankers or farmers or business owners, and they don't know how to pick up a gun. They don't know how to go fight. And then they're forced into this situation. I mean, it's traumatic for anyone, whether they choose it or not, but can you imagine going against your will and having to do this? And so you have this man- (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I mean, he got this man that by all accounts didn't have a, I mean, he was a tough individual, but he didn't have a violent bone in his body. Yeah, And he's having to go fight. He absolutely detested it. So because of that experience, he was terrified of getting back into what he thought was like kind of menial work. He wanted to avoid that. He said, this is a quote, he said, these big laborers hands of mine are my unwanted souvenir of that time. So he wanted a full escape. He wanted to completely get away from that. I do. I just wonder, you're talking about him not knowing these people and kind of maybe having an identity crisis because mm -hmm. of it. I wonder what that did for him as an actor, like how it helped him as an entry into acting. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, so after, and I don't even think he's, he knew he wanted to do that. He didn't know he wanted to do that. What he wanted to do was still pursue photography. That's kind of in his blood, right? So after he gets out of the war and he's just hating it, he moved to Tokyo and he wants to get a photography job. So one of his friends, and I think it was a friend that he may have met while in the Imperial Air Force, hmm. says, hey, come to Toho you know, they're hiring people all the time to host studios. And he was going to be an assistant cameraman. And so I think he was going to get into making films, which again, I want to see a movie shot by him, but I'm so glad that he ended up in front of the camera. Right. But he ends up, instead of pursuing that job, they have this contest and it was um, the, the wanted new faces contest. Right. 
Mm. And he gets in there and he does this audition. And I don't even think he knew, he didn't know how to act. He didn't know what an audition process was, right? But Akira Kurosawa, who was, I don't want to say he was an unknown, but he was definitely early on in his career, right? And he was on this panel judging these new talents. And Kendall, I have to read you this Go quote yeah. from Kurosawa, which is really hilarious. It says, a young man was reeling around the room in a violent frenzy. <laughs> it was as frightening as watching a wounded or trapped savage beast trying to break loose. I stood transfixed. But it turned out that this young man was not really in a rage, but had drawn anger as the emotion that he had to express in the screen test. He was acting. When he finished his performance, he regained his chair and with an exhausted demeanor flopped down and began to glare menacingly at the judges. Now, I know very well that this kind of behavior was a cover for shyness, but the jury seemed to be interpreting it as disrespect. <laughs> <laughs> well, and there's, so a, you, there's a cultural element there. At play that's too. right. Yeah. But you see, you know, but you hear this, you re, or you read this quote from Kurosawa, and I, I believe this is in Kurosawa's little autobiography that he wrote. And he, you can almost imagine Mifuni doing this. Because if you think about yeah. Seven Samurai or right. um, Stray Dog, I mean, he is just, he is insane. In, I, in I his... did picture it. Yes, you can I see saw him. him. I saw and the glare see, even. You see the glare and you see the yeah. hair kind of flopping down. Or if he's in a samurai, you know, he's got that scowl going on. And now, again, Kurosawa is writing this with the benefit of hindsight, you know, he wrote this after the fact. And so he may be influencing some of that with what he knows of Mifune now, right? Mm -hmm. But it's so spot on. It is so spot on. And it really was Kurosawa that convinced them to give him a shot. Because they were like, this dude's, this dude's nuts. Get him out of here. Well, and he knew what to do with the emotion. I mean, right. it's not just that right. in any culture... That would be wild and a lot to take and process. But this is Japanese culture that this man is like this. Yeah. That's what kind of blows my mind. And you see it right. in the films, the difference mm -hmm. in his demeanor compared to everyone Absolutely. else. How, how did he become the tops when he was so at odds with so many things in this culture? Right, right. That's 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 what's so wild to me is that he, I, and, and I think what's funny is that he, to me, Mifune, kind of represents the modern Japanese man, right? Even though he's playing a lot of these roles, he's playing um, you know, samurai and in this in this like really strict feudal social system, right? But Mifune himself was this is like the prime post-war Japanese man, right? he's wearing yeah. nice suits and he's got his hair slick it's very like western influence which is what was so much of the the style post world war ii but i mean the 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 western influence on on japanese dress japanese culture was wildly apparent but i always think it's so so funny that he became the guy he yeah. is the guy from japan and someone who was just so dismissive of the war and the fact that he wasn't even born like you know he he didn't he was 20 or 21 years old before he even entered the country for the first time so having that separation there I, i've always found that very fascinating do you know how the audience responded to this i mean it must have been positive if he had this long career if he had they love so him. much acclaim i mean was there something that they were wanting to be that he represented Absolutely. He's the epitome of cool. He's got, has this very intimidating presence. He, he's stoic, but then he's got this, he's got this wild streak in him too, right? That especially Kurosawa knew how to tap into. And right. that's, and that's the thing is, you know, Kendall, we were talking before we started that, you know, I'm, I'm still discovering Mifune. I've only scratched the surface with him in terms of his career. It was a very, very long career. So I think like a lot of people, the vast majority have seen just his work with Kurosawa, which is 
a significant portion of his career and arguably Mm -hmm. the best part of his career, right? I will say that I've seen a few things outside of his collaborations with Kurosawa and no one, no one could tap into his talent the way Kurosawa did. Oh, agreed. They had a powerful working relationship collaboration that is unmatched. I don't, you know, you think about Cary Grant and Alfred Hitchcock or John Wayne and John Ford or uh, Betty Davis and William Wyler. I think this is probably the strongest collaboration between an actor and director where they both needed each other. Yeah, I do see having a director on your side helping you develop as being the way to become a big star. Yeah. So there is that. And there's also the fact that the actor can make the director. John I mean, Jean-Luc Godard, I would say that. Happened. Absolutely. Yeah. And with Kurosawa, that's it's not to say that he didn't make other great movies because he absolutely did. Yes. Mufune is not in Akiru. Mufune is not in Dreams. Mufune is not in Ron. I mean, Ron is probably, it might be my favorite Kurosawa, okay? And there is there is no Mufune to be seen. Mm-hmm. But it, as far as developing his yeah, art. Yeah, it's, that's yeah. just, they have, the, like I said, I think it was 18, 19 films they made together. And, you know, they talk about like, this is so cheesy, but like, you know, it's like lightning in a bottle. They they got it like 18 times. Like it, it that there's I mean, not, I mean, I haven't seen all of them, but no, they're all. There's, I cannot funny. think of another collaboration that has the same power. They're all fantastic, but this one is, it's like they're dependent upon one another. There's a real humanity know? in there. Yeah. And this is something Absolutely. that Kurosawa has as a director. You know, mm-hmm. I, I I was actually a thing that made me think about that was Barry Jenkins emerging as a director. When he got to his second mm-hmm. film, I thought he just taps into people. He makes you right. love people, all people. Mm-hmm. And I, I think Kurosawa, that's a little bit of his magic too. You know, like this, these Mifuni characters, you know, stick in just enough warmth to make you, he'll menace the children and then he'll make them laugh mm-hmm. kind of a thing. Yeah. And I think that they both together tap into that humanity and that's why it's not this perfectly pleasant film or even just a classic that you really love but it really gets in your soul it's it's something profound with every Mm -hmm. story that they're telling when they talk about like becoming an overnight star yeah that's literally what happened here with Mifune Kurosawa goes to bat for him right gets him in there with Toho and then says hey you got to put this guy under contract and they're like I don't know about this so Mifune makes three films in 1947. And one of those is his debut in Senkichi Taniguchi's Snow Trail, which Kurosawa wrote. And then he does two films for Kajiro Yamamoto, which is These Foolish Times and These Foolish Times Part Two. Then he makes his first true Kurosawa collaboration and it's Drunken Angel. This goes nuts right? It is so popular. And this makes Kurosawa their top director. And this makes Mifune its biggest international star. So he's made, he's by his fourth movie. Yeah. He's it. And they, he gets the nickname Worldwide Mifune. Wow. So that's how different he was from anyone else, right? And how Kurosawa was able to he's he's great in drunken angel and although at times i mean and there there are people that will are critical of mifune in some of his roles because they think he's a bit of a scenery chewer and i get it he's very animated right and um he's very large and definitely uses every inch of space (laughs) that's a very good way of putting it yes right but it's also just a different style of acting. The filmmaking is different. Even when Kurosawa was straight up, not I don't want to say lifting, but a lot of his, his films were inspired by John Ford and a lot of his camera shots, and which by the way, Kurosawa did all of his edi- editing himself. He did his editing, his filming. He had locked in control. He did not want anyone touching that. Okay. That makes sense. I mean, that's how the message is so clean. In exactly. These films. 
And he would, you know, to get a shot, like, especially in Seven, Seven Samurai, he would have like a gajillion cameras set up from every possible angle because he just wanted continuous shots of all the, especially during those battle sequences. So that's why it's so immersive and so like you struggle to catch your breath right and that's that's by design and he would and then he would at the end of the, he would be shooting all day and at the end of the day he'd go in and edit it himself bit of a control freak <laughs> but i'll take you it. know yeah so so the style of filmmaking even though it was greatly inspired by western hollywood filmmaking the films themselves are not hollywood right it's a different it's a different style it's a different feel the storytelling is is different the the they don't play by the same rules it you isn't know, artificial is, no there's no haze code you know production code breathing down his neck so there's a there's a way so I, sometimes i think yeah was mafune hammy at times yeah maybe but i mean so was every other huge star i mean was betty davis hammy at times yeah bet all the time you know sometimes i, I think there's a little current of um i'm not trying to think if i want to say this but there, there's there's definitely some like maybe a little bit of bigotry that's going oh, you in there think so i think so i think when people are critical of you know any kind of international film yeah. for like it's or like the acting styles or like I, I maybe they're not it's maybe it's not conscious but i do think they're they're applying western i mean it's hard yeah. it's hard to not right because it's your experience this is what you live in and so it's hard to not compare but i do so see I condescension do, there's a there is absolute condescension con to it. yeah yeah i think there is and so think, yeah, if you go, well, this guy's, this guy, I don't know, he's just all over the place. He's chewing scenery. He's doing this, doing that. I don't know. It's, it's extremely stylized. It, it's the type of film. And it, sometimes I feel like there's a fear of giving yourself over to it or like letting whatever preconceived notions you have about how a story should be told or how the person yes. acting that's, you know, so, and that's kind of the, I think the apprehension a lot of people have to international cinema is like kind of that fear of something that's unconventional and i say unconventional in that it's not american you just um, deal with your discomfort by right criticizing so it. maybe bigotry is a hard word maybe it's more of like a discomfort and maybe a little myopic yeah view, if that well, makes sense i mean something like say throne of blood what you look into it you have to understand the beats that it is following from like stage tradition it's it's shakespeare and, and, yeah it's it's yeah. straight up shakespeare but it's got this east west meets west version of stage traditions it's got mm -hmm. both of them in there yeah and if you understand that then mm -hmm. it draws you in right it, it hits you in the ribs you know mm -hmm. that might be one of my favorites because of the way it melds those two traditions so well yeah all of these movies i mean even all of the samurai movies they're all they're all westerns it's just a fact. Oh, I didn't and relate yes, to it that way. Oh, that's so interesting to Samurai they, movies. They all are. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, and and again, because Kurosawa was in awe of John Ford. Yeah. And then what's funny is, you know, he makes Seven Samurai, which is a Western. It is straight up a Western. And then you get The Magnificent Seven, which mm -hmm. is a remake of Seven Samurai or a reimagining of Seven Samurai. So you have hollywood western influencing this great japanese filmmaker that is influencing hollywood western like and so it's this circle of cinematic know, life <laughs> yeah it's it's a it's an ongoing exchange between the yeah. two it's fantastic a ronin movie a samurai movie that's a western right you know it's it it's it's just it's just in a different period it's just a different culture but it the, it's the same kind of tropes you find in a western the lone gunslinger that comes into town and has a shadowy past we don't know anything about him but he has a kindness to him he's ultimately on the right side and then he goes off onto his next adventure i mean right. this absolutely. is absolutely this you, is yeah. you know western 101 you're going yojimbo to the man yes. of no name yeah yep yeah okay i can't let you go without getting 
some must sees? What's a handful that will get you into Mufuni's world? Let me start with if you are hesitant about let's say you just like I'm not watching a samurai movie that I can't I don't know if I can get into that then I would say the first movie to get into would be Stray Dog that's because thing. yeah it is straight up noir and essentially it is about a young police officer and his um, I guess mentor police officer played by Takashi Shimura who I love and it's hot it's like the hottest day of the year and they're on a very crowded trolley and the young police officers or det- their detectives his gun gets stolen and just taken out of his holster and the whole movie is him trying to get his gun back because crimes are being committed with his gun and so uh, it's got everything um and he's so handsome mm-hmm. and he's so young I would say it's it's kind of got that it's that noir vibe, the gangster kind of thing going on. And they're very much in modern day dress, modern meaning uh, 1940. When is that? 1948, I think. 49 is when Stray Dog came out. So that would be like a really like if you like old Hollywood yeah. gangster movies, noir, that would be the first one. Stray Dog is 1949. Then Rashomon might be the second one I would recommend. Although I love the film. It's not like in my top five, but the reason why I would say Rashomon is because it has such influence on filmmaking and it's referenced in so many like pop culture um, and the essential gist of this film is something happens. I won't say what, And there are three different accounts of what happens. And it's the Rashomon effect. And so you just have to see it for that. I would also, Seven Samurai is just an absolute masterpiece. Mm -hmm. It is long, but a must. Throne of Blood we talked about is adaptation of Macbeth. And just... It's stunning. It's (laughs) just a amazing film hidden fortress again not necessarily my favorite but i think it's a good one to start with kids yes um because it i mean like george lucas ripped this off for star wars it is oh it's so up, obvious it's a straight up rip off and it might be better yo jimbo sanjuro great those paired together my favorite I believe next to uh, Stray Dog is High and Low. Oh, there's so much to that one. High and there's Low. There's so many phases. A, it's yes. also long, but it's like Seven Samurai where you just have to go into the world and right. the many turns it takes. That's right. And so High and Low, it's it, it again, that may also be another good movie for someone that's hesitant to kind of get into the samurai thing. Um, <laughs> it's stunningly beautiful it's terrifying if you're a parent it is exceedingly terrifying um but it's devastating on so many levels yeah Kendall one thing I want to say is that Mifune and Kurosawa had a falling out and they finished um Redbeard and That is a film I have not seen. And the reason why I have not seen it is because I worry that it's going to be like way too emotional for me because they were at odds during that production. I understand that. Kind of around this time, Mufune started his own production company and that really bothered Kurosawa. So that they had an estrangement and they never repaired that and but there was an actor who uh you fujiki who worked with both of them and this quote just totally punches me in the feels every single time and this is what fujiki said he said mr kurosawa's heart was in mr mifuni's body Mm. so I think they had such a mutual admiration for each other. And I think Kurosawa looked at Mifuni wanting to go and 
kind of break away and do his own thing as like a betrayal. Carrying his heart out. Yeah. But I think ultimately they had a love for one another, you know, which I mean, when you have an estrangement, there was, I mean, people who are just like acquaintances don't have an estrangement, right? So Mm -hmm. there was a significant relationship there and it was and it and there they fought you know, and that's what happens when creatives get together. This happens, right? So it's always kind of sad to me that they never repaired that. Yeah. But it always feels a little inevitable in hindsight because it's so intense. They rely on each other so much. There's so many things that can break. It's fragile. All of those, you know, you look at any intense creative partnership and they're not built to last. Yeah you know, there there has to be an end to it. And yeah, so I'm always kind of like, you know, sad about that. It, but that, that it couldn't have had this pretty bow on it instead. No, but the films exist. The films are there. That's right. Well, Joe, always there. Joe, before I let you go, I, I would like you to talk a little bit about your new venture because it sounds very yes. exciting. So um, Aaron West and I had a podcast called Criterion Now, and um, Aaron actually started that podcast, I think in 2017 or 2018. And then he would have me on as a guest um, quite frequently. And then in 2021, he asked me to come on and be a full-time co-host, which I did. And then last year, he approached me with this great idea. And we decided, yeah, let's do it. And so in the last, so over the last year, we've been doing planning and just kind of soft launched um, a, it's actual business called Cine Journeys. And we have a podcast component. Criterion Now podcast is over. We do have the Cine Journeys podcast. And, but that's just kind of a small part. Um, we are having these, um, we do these things called journeys and it'll be monthly. We'll probably have multiple going on at the same time where we have a theme. We um, select films from it. People join us and we watch the movies and then we have discussions. And then there's, we're actually building a whole platform on our website. Wow. Um, there's going to be forums. We have a sub stack, which is, kind of the entry way into Cine Journeys. So we put like our unedited, unedited podcast episodes there, extra bonus videos. And then and then we have everything that we're currently building on the website. It's not fully there yet. And so right now we're doing our journey, our very first journey on November. And we had uh, quite a few people on our call last night. It was awesome. Yeah. Was so awesome. And everybody's sitting there going, I've never seen this movie before. And if it hadn't been for you, I would have, you know, I wouldn't have watched it, you know? So we're going to be watching like Ida Lupino movies and some Hitchcock and, you know, Billy Wilder. And so it's, it's great. And starting next year, we will actually be onboarding people to lead their own journeys and they'll be called guides. So we're going to have some great ones, but like I'm planning, I'm, I want to do like a Columbo journey. Oh, yes. I'm, I'm going to do um, probably a Carl Reiner, Steve Martin journey. I mean, we have got so many ideas and it's, it's going to be a blast. So that's kind of what we're doing. Well, I'm going to make sure we have information about that in the yes. show notes so Absolutely. that people can, can check it out because it does sound like literally an exciting journey to be able to kind of dive into these things the sense of discovery sounds very exciting Mm -hmm. so I'm very excited for you I I love your creativity with your projects you always kind of jab right into the excitement (laughs) of it you know the excitement of discovery and the love that we feel for movies and ways to express that so that's really wonderful and And it's nice to have a like there's not many women in this space Kendall you know this and so it I have feels been approached good. about this. Yes. Right. And so Aaron is, he's such a great partner to have in this. And, and we are like, we are straight down 50, 50 on all decisions. You know, we have a very good collaborative, collaborative relationship, but I want more women to join these journeys. I was just saying this last night to Aaron, I was like, it was a great group, but we only had one other woman. So I was like, we've got to get, mm-hmm some women voices in here. So I'm working on that. So it's, 
but you know, you know this that the that the um and I and I love men, but um it goes without we need, saying we're just yeah. balancing the plane here. I know everybody's so, welcome. We love you all. That's yes, so we just we just need a little more representation. So yeah. I'm hoping, Kendall, that you'll pop on at some point and, oh, and join absolutely. in and that people that listen will join in and just what you time know. or what do I wear? I'm there. Yeah, I will. I will tell you. I'll yeah, let you know. Yeah. But yeah, we just I, ultimately what and I know that you you can relate to this. And I know that people listening to this can relate to this is that online spaces are tricky and they're not always healthy spaces and they're not always safe spaces. And one of the major platforms that we all talked about film is just going down the tubes. And so, and the blog world is not what it used to be, right? And so we don't have yeah. the, you know, back and forth in the comment section. We don't have the message boards anymore. We don't have the same community. Spaces. Exactly. And the spaces that we were t- talking in were being domineered by let's just say bad actors a lot of well actually is going on and so for the joy of it absolutely that's right and so our whole goal here is to create it's an insular community in that the people that are there want to be there and Mm -hmm. it's not people that are just popping in in a reply to for the attention right it's Mm -hmm. it's insular but welcoming so that's so that's what we're trying to build is a community where people are there. They want to talk about film. And our number one rule is don't be a dick. Right. And it's like, if you're, you know, it, if you break this rule, then you're out. And so that's really what we're trying to build. Because it's it, I get sick and tired of not being able to discuss these things in a, in a space where I don't have some jerk popping in and acting like I don't know anything, which is, yeah. you know, about my Mafuni, you know, I would post something and some idiot would hop in and right to tell me something about him. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's kind of our goal here is just to have yeah. a, a good, healthy community to talk about the stuff we love. So the concept, it, it, it feels like an evolution that we're moving towards people, people yeah. want a, a kinder, gentler community. You know, yeah, we need it makes an a escape. lot of sense. A safe, a, a safe place is is yes is mocked often, but but it's what everybody really wants at heart. It's so what it they want, yeah. and we're being completely inundated. I mean, the world's on fire, yeah. and it's terrible. And yeah, and that's not to say that some of these films we're going to watch are going to be heavy, right? Or some of the discussions we're going to have about these films are are going to be heavy, but. The, why do we watch movies? Why do yeah. we watch television? It's mm-hmm. to escape, right? It's to immerse ourselves in another world. Why not continue that in discussion in a healthy way yeah. so that you can have something that you you can break away from this constant Absolutely. barrage of crap? I mean, you can have vigor without having hellfire. Absolutely. <laughs> right. Jill, I'm so excited about it. I was so great to finally have this conversation with you. I've been curious to talk to you about this for so long. And I, I just, I really appreciate you coming on and I'd love to have you on again someday. Well, this was awesome. Any chance to talk about, well, any kind of movie is great, especially with another lady. And um, so thank you so much for having me. It was great. Thank you. Appreciate it. For more information about Jill Blake and Cine Journeys, go to watchingclassicmovies.com. Please rate and review the show wherever you listen. I appreciate your support. Thank you for listening. This is Kendall Kruver, watching classic movies. Until next time.